Hi, Chris. You know, <clears throat> Trevor, it's kind of one of these things where, you know, you used to get to the meeting, you'd be there a little early, you get a chance to chat with folks, and we don't do that anymore. So you're yeah. either at the meeting, or you're not, and there's that that sort of little back and forth that you used to have, you don't you don't really get anymore. Yeah, it's a struggle. Well, it's nice, then, nice when we can do that again. Yeah, it would be really nice. Well, I'm not. I'm not hearing you there. Uh, you're, it doesn't look like your speaker is muted. Maybe it's your headphones. No, oh, now you're muted again. Can you hear me, Chris? Still don't hear you. Trevor, he can't hear me either. I just emailed him to let him know. I think it's his sound. Oh, uh, okay. No. Huh. So your mute button is on for... Hey, Jeremy. Hello, Chris, Trevor, Megan, oh, Ellis. Maybe it's me. Okay, so I'm not hearing Jeremy or Trevor, so maybe the problem is on my side. Sales are booming. You need to hire. I mean, indeed. Indeed you do. The moment you spawn. Trevor, can you hear me okay? Okay, the problem was on my side. Sorry, Trevor. So, Chris, you can yeah. hear us now? Yeah, yeah. I, I muted my computer a while back for some reason and forgot that I pushed that button. All right. Uh, disregard the emails that you're receiving. <laughs> all righty. <laughs> Again, you know, it's these little things. That I was, was just telling Trevor, Jeremy, and, uh, you know, you used to show up to a meeting early or you stayed a little later because you could like chat with people and it just it was such a casual thing you know just catch yeah. up and whatnot and and we you don't really get a chance to do that really much anymore it's all I'm just right that, yeah i'm hopeful that we'll have meetings in person i don't know maybe in the fall or something depending on how everything progresses yeah yeah i i have not heard anything about what the city plans are uh how soon they plan on getting back to work and it's a good question yeah i mean not get i mean literally in the physical sense get back to work <laughs> they've been That's working wrong. yeah they have not they yeah ellis how are things at school from a covid perspective and just generally from a overall perspective oh uh, things at school are still school in the time of covid um so uh, they're good though good as can be i think but, yeah. do uh do students get frustrated or teachers get frustrated more easily uh definitely i think there's just a summer will be nice and hopefully fall will be different so you know it'd be cool to have classes outside i know logistically that might be a little bit of a challenge but i've certainly seen some schools with kind of outdoor spaces set up that might make it a little bit easier to Especially when the weather's nice. 
Yeah, yeah. Unlike this morning when it became winter again for the last hour. Yeah, indeed. So, so Ellis, uh, are there things that you haven't done that you might otherwise? Did I, I, uh, I judged the science fair uh, a couple of them, and and we're getting about a quarter of the number of students that normally participate in science fair right now. Mm, yeah. No, I, I think just everything's just yeah. Crazy. How how is that? Is that has that been completed yet? Or yeah, that we just had the state uh, last week. Okay. But yeah, it was a it was a it was virtual, of course, and it was challenging technologically and and all of that stuff. Um, but but it it got through. But yeah, we like I said we had about a quarter of the usual participation. Oh well. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I can imagine. And now they're identifying, you know, sports is one of those sort of super spreader things. A lot of uh, students traveling to sporting events and their parents and coaches and stuff that, that has not been a good, uh, as, as well controlled as it is in school, oddly enough, where you spend a lot more time in school. But youth sports have been more of a problem in terms of spreading COVID. I'm surprised that some of the sports have been allowed to continue. I mean, when you think of wrestling and even, you know, I've seen a lot of sports in other states where they're playing basketball with masks on and volleyball and with masks and things like that. So. Yeah. Yeah. But yet, you know, the, the science fair was virtual. No one got to get right. it. Yeah. Somehow it seems like there's a, a disconnect there. Definitely. All right. Well, it's a few minutes after noon, and so we, we got our few minutes of chit-chat. We were just saying, Amber, that you don't get a chance to chit-chat with folks anymore when you just do these virtual meetings. I know. You come right at the exact time. You leave right at the time. I know. Right. You don't walk in the door five minutes early. And I want to say before, I, before we get started that I need to be um, done by 12.50 today, but that should give us time to get through most of it, don't you think? It's a short, it's a short uh, uh, agenda today. So yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, Hi, Ellis and Grace. And let's see, we've got Virgil. I don't know. Hi, you guys. So uh, maybe we'll do introductions. Uh, Amber, um, here, uh, maybe under announcements or something. Um, so we're, we're uh, calling the meeting, the regular meeting of the Energy and Climate Team to order today. Uh, on March, April 8th, 2021. Um, Megan, you wanna call the roll? Yes, sorry, I was juggling too many things at once. Yeah, yeah, it looked like it. Yeah, it did. <laughs> Chris Rowe. A present. Jeremy. Present. Trevor. Present. Michael. Brian. And yeah. Scott said he was going to be absent. David? And David announced he was going to be absent as well. Okay, thank you. Josh? Oh, sorry, I forgot to remove him. Uh, Virgil? Here. Ellis? Present. Grace? Here. Aviv? No, Aviv. And Amber? Present. Thank you. And Michael, Michael Dorshorst was planning on being here, but only for the first hour. Okay. <laughs> when he pops Aviv, up. I'll... Sorry. Aviv was also planning on being here, but um, she must just be late or something. Okay, thanks. I'll include them when they show up. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up is the, the approval or uh, checking in on the minutes from our last meeting, the March 11th. 2021 meeting. Um, and we certainly had a long discussion about the uh, the draft implementation plan on the MOU. I was I, I remembered some some really in, interesting discussion when I was going back over that. That was that was a was a good conversation and a really good set of minutes on that. And any other comments, uh, corrections, suggestions on the minutes from the meeting for February 11th? 
Hearing none, uh, I, somebody want to uh, move to approve those minutes? And I'll motion to approve. All right, I don't know. Um, and minutes, we don't need a second, I don't think. All right, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Hearing none, minutes are approved as submitted. Thank you, Megan. Um, go back to the agenda. All right, announcements. Uh, before we start, uh, we do have uh, Amber here today, and I know some of uh, you, including Trevor and our youth team members, may have not met Amber. So maybe a little round of introductions between Amber and and our youth members and Trevor. You wanna jump right in, Amber? Sure, thanks. And I apologize, I haven't been here. It's um, I'm also on the health board and it has been a very crazy year um, being on that board, as you might imagine. And those, um, those meetings do conflict usually with this. So that's been, um, hopefully, I, I'm really hoping for many reasons beyond just the meeting times not conflicting that um, that will die down and I think it will. So I'm hoping to make these meetings going forward. Um, I am on city council in ward four and I'm the parks and conservation committee chair, which is um, how I'm involved in this committee. Um, and so I know, I, I know uh, Grace and I know um, Ellis as well. So um, crossover with kids, kids, friends, they're all kids, friends. Um, and I don't, Trevor, I don't have, have we met at any point? I'm not totally sure, but that that's who I am. I don't know if we have, you look familiar, but. I know you I'm do too. Sure. I can't tell. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. So, so Trevor, you've been on, this is your third meeting, right? Yep. So I'm a new member, uh, just started right before all the students. Um, I, I am fairly new to Missoula, so I don't know if maybe in past life we've only been here just over a year now, um, but I work at Merrill Lynch, and then uh, maybe you've come to some of our Kiwanis meetings, perhaps? I don't know if that's where maybe... I interviewed you for this position. That's actually... Oh, okay. Where yeah. <laughs> yeah, After I said, where we familiar. met, I thought, I know where we met. We interviewed uh, today. I, COVID time. Yeah. A long time ago now. So yeah, it's good to get uh, a financial perspective on some of this uh, uh, this conservation efforts, these uh, carbon reduction efforts. So we appreciate Trevor's help. Um, and you know, Grace and Alice, uh, Virgil, why don't you let us know what school and grade you're in and what sort of projects you're working on? Um, well, I'm Virgil Jones. Um, I'm an eighth grader at CS Porter Middle School. Um, and I guess I could say how I got interested in I, the climate and climate change um, was mostly last year um, when the climate strikes were happening. I decided to go to it and I heard all the speakers and I just realized how important of an issue this was and I decided to get more involved. So, yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. All righty. Um... So we've got a few items here on the announcements. Actually, I think I'm going to add a fourth one. But uh, so Josh Nichols departed. Um, I think he reached out to everybody. Uh, but as you know, he was a special victims advocate um, in the Air Force. And he went uh, he went from being a, a, a reservist Air National Guard to active duty active duty in order to take on this position to work with uh, folks who have been uh, injured and impacted uh, through no fault of their own. Um, in, in the Air Force and, and working on their behalf. So that's a really important project. So, but that created a conflict of interest sometimes when you're in the, in the government, um, in particular in the military, you have to be careful um, that you don't uh, create conflicts between your position and, uh, and any outside activities. So that's where he went. So we wish him all the best. Hopefully we'll see him again. Um, along that that way, uh, we've had this discussion about how to fill uh, Josh's position, and it has been um, sort of an unwritten policy that um, our, our alternative alternates, who in this case was David, 
um, would would be asked if they wish to be uh, move into that position. And then they would, if they said no, then we could go and advertise. But if not, they would just move into that position. And then we would advertise for the alternate. Now, as it turned out, uh, and talking with uh, Amber and Megan and others, that's not really ever been written down. It's not a formal policy of our, of our team. At some point, we probably need to put it in the, uh, in the uh, bylaws. Uh, but for now, I think we need to, uh, we can't really act on that this today because there's, there's no action items, but we'll probably write up something to at least make it a policy in the interim until we get a chance to update our minutes. So I'll probably write that up and send it out to everybody and we can finalize it as a, as a, as a policy at our next meeting. Um, Chris, yeah, can ahead, I, Jeremy. just Megan, just so you know, Michael Dorshorst is here. You may have already seen that, but Thank just you, an FYI. Okay. Also, Chris, I don't know if you want us to raise our hand. I'm using the little raise hand feature. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, so it just takes me a minute to remember. Okay, Amber, please. Uh, thanks. Um, also, just um, Megan and I have had some conversations, um, and Megan, I'm not sure where you are on that exactly, but um, that there's going to be a referral put in because as it stands right now, since it's, I, I think the bylaws would make it okay to not actually have that change. Um, uh go through city council, but right now we need to um, make him officially have a vote and make um, uh, David, right? Yes. David, um, David, uh, uh, move him into a position and out of uh, alternate. So we're going to do that and we'll make that. I, I mean, I think that um, since you all support that move, I think it's a technicality, but one that we need to we need to go through for now. And then I would suggest that we change the bylaws, put in a referral for that change, um, and then we'll just discuss it. And I I, I can't imagine there's going to be a problem, but I think it's good because when when city council is um, putting people into positions on boards, um, as long as they know that if they vote someone in as an alternate, that they will in the absence of with someone leaving that they would become um, a regular voting member. And that's not how it's set up now. So to cross all our T's, we need to vote him in, which uh, I, Megan's uh, either has already done that and it'll probably come to us this next week or two. I'm actually still waiting on confirmation from David. Marty, let me know that we do need to actually have a yes from the person that they want to serve in a different function. And Chris, let me know that David's out in nature teaching people wonderful things probably. Um, so there might be a little bit of a delay in him being able to respond, but I've left him a voicemail and sent him an email last week. Um, so hopefully he'll be able to confirm um, that promotion soon. Okay, great. And we, I don't think we'll have any delay getting it through council or anything. So uh, just a confirmation, um, does it just go through your committee or does it have to go to the city council? It'll go through the committee and then assuming that it is a unanimous vote, it will just go on the consent agenda for the following Monday night. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, the next step uh, in terms of announcements, it's more of an update, um, the mission, the Missoula mission inventory update and also the Missoula Energy Conservation Specialist position update. So these are actually going to get wrapped together. So I've heard back from Montana James. Montana is the uh, um, Deputy Director of Community Development Division of the Community Planning Development and Innovation Department. Man, they, they, they <laughs> they've done some reorganization. I'm sure everyone's involved. It's, it's pretty funny. You gotta still get a little word, word spaghetti going on there. Um, but anyways, what, what, uh, what Montana is saying is that they're still working through the hiring process and that, you know, as kind of happens, it takes a little longer than you would expect to get through all the the interviews, which they did uh, a couple weeks ago, and then they're checking ref uh, references and, and probably a few other things and having some internal discussions within the department on, on the hiring. So it's still in process as near as we know, but it should be done shortly. And then the new um, um, 
energy conservation specialist will come on and that will help them move the next item, which is the emission inventory forward. So Charlotte Fisk, I think I said that right, um, has is basically done with the internal one. So they have a municipal one and they have a community one. The municipal one is emissions that relate to the, the city government. So parks and recreation, you know, uh, Missoula water, all of those things. Uh, then they're going to have a broader community one, which looks at the emissions across the entire city of Missoula. Uh, we're really looking forward to that because one of the things that Charlotte's been doing is there's a model out there. Uh, it's it, it, The acronyms are ICLEI, and that's actually the name of an organization that helps um, municipal governments uh, do carbon um, uh, modeling and, and also work on how to address um, carbon reductions. Uh, it's a really good model, but uh, it's been a big effort. If you've, if you've ever done one of these very data intensive models, you know, you're putting numbers in and checking them and then revising them and, and realizing some numbers don't make sense and some do. So as they get this through, they're trying to also build themselves a process, a set of guidelines. So in, in out years, it's not going to take six months, which is based six, seven months they've been working on this. We originally thought we'd see it sometime in like December uh, before it was released to the community. So uh, so it, it's probably worth getting this done correctly this time and hopefully it'll be a much uh, easier lift the next time out. So within the next few weeks, they'll get the, uh, the community one done and then they'll do some internal feedback um, within the city and then they'll uh, hopefully get the new specialist started and, this, and the new specialist to be the person who kind of rolls that out uh, to, the, to the broader community and to organizations like ours. So they'll be in touch and, uh, and hopefully maybe by the next meeting or two, we'll get to see some of that data. And I, I really am excited to dig in because I'm a data nerd. Uh, hopefully uh, right now we don't have access to the model, but it would be really nice to get access to the raw data um, that they're using and, and, and how this um, how this tool works. So uh, we may to try to do a presentation on that or something. So anyways, does anybody have any questions or comments on either of those two items? All right, and for our new team members, I think we, um, the other one, the, the specialist, the, a gentleman named Chase, Chase Jones was in this position for many years. And I think he just got burned out because it's a really hard position. Um, and, uh, and so this position works on all kinds of issues, uh, not just carbon reduction, but all these sort of um, issues that have energy related elements. One of the ones I think at some point we'll want to dig in a little bit more is zero by 50. I, I asked this because um, I just wonder who knows about this. Uh, just show of physical hands. Who knows about zero by 50 of the of the of our youth students? Okay, good. Well, that's pretty exciting. It's more than I thought. Um, but anyways, that's one of the big efforts they're leading. Um, the 100% clean electricity is another one. Um, these emission inventories, some of the other stuff. Uh, the implementation of the city of Missoula's carbon reduction goals um, is another one of their big ones. Okay, next up, public comment on items not listed on the agenda. Um, at the top of our agenda, if you go to the eScribe system, you can Thanks, find Chris. the information. Yes, Megan. Oh, thank you for putting it up. It's... Hey, Chris, I was gonna say, <laughs> I keep raising my hand. I feel like I'm in the city. <laughs> yeah, I know. So I'll go like this. I'll, yeah, I'll I'll go that's, that's okay. I was just going to say, so, you know, Chase's position, um, you know, there is a little bit, as you can tell by the, the really long, uh, what will be even a long acronym for Montana's department. Um, you know, I think there's going to be some reworking of that, uh, that position and how that position looks and how that position works with this committee. Um, so I, I'm looking forward to that, but that position is also, um, you know, all those city policies. And I know since I interviewed uh, 
a lot of people that are on the call right now, I know that a lot of them know about it because I think we may have asked you about it. Um, and you guys all did your research on kind of the, the zero by 50 and all those. Um, but that position, you know, is regularly communicating with city leadership around where we are on the metrics of getting to those city goals. So those, um, you know, as far as the, the, what that person is doing in their job, that's a big piece of it, right? Is, is working on getting us toward these conservation goals that we have ultimately. Well said, thank you. Um, give folks a chance to log in um, and, uh, and, and raise their hands. Haven't seen anybody. It's worth noting if anybody else is listening on our YouTube channel or other places, comment on any item. Um, it doesn't just, this is just items that are not already, that are not on the agenda, but any other items on the agenda, you're welcome to join in as, as a public member. It's a little weird sometimes with this virtual stuff, how, how you do that, but, but it can be done. All right, and uh, moving on to item five, uh, action items. We have no action items today. Um, we may next time. Um, I do want to add a little, a little uh, comment about the agenda. I've been thinking about this. I, I usually put the agenda together, just pulling stuff sometimes out of uh, thin air sometimes, or just stuff we've been talking about, or I'll talk to Jeremy, we talk to Amber. So the three of us talk regularly. We actually try to meet every other week, uh, but there is no magic here. So if anybody uh, wishes to put an item on the agenda, just notify me and we can work that out. So, so I, it's, it, there's no proprietary effort here that, that keeps uh, any of you members from, from putting uh, an item on the agenda. So that was my little spiel there. And I have a, yeah, you want, ahead, am Amber. I bugging you, Chris, that I keep interrupting you? I keep, <laughs> no, no, I, okay, I keep raising my hand. And I, then I, I know, like I keep I'm, interrupting. that's okay. I keep um, looking at my other screen. No. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, and I, I would say along that, that same line of what Chris is saying, if there are things within um, with city policies or that you feel like you need to know more about, or you think would be a good thing for this committee to hear from. And I'm, I'm uh, talking to our youth members and, and Trevor as well. I'm talking to everyone, but um, I, I think just, uh, yeah, uh, putting those out there to Chris and we can discuss who might be good to come in for presentations. And, you know, I think the more we all understand the policies and um, how everything works, the more effective we're gonna be in our role as a committee for the, the city. So um, I just kind of throw that out there. If there are things you don't understand <clears throat> um, or you feel like we need to know more about, yeah, get those to Chris. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, uh, during our team member comments, we're going to kind of open the floor. But one of the things that I thought would be useful to talk about when we have a little more time than we normally do is, you know, we had those series of articles, we had the podcast that Michael sent out, and then the, the information that uh, Virgil sent out um, about the drawdown, and then we saw uh, some other articles that have come out, and so really useful information. I really encourage that, and then if we have a little time to chat about them, that would be also great. Okay, state legislative uh, update. I'm going to hand this off to Jeremy and Michael. Could I Sounds have good. Comment, Chris. Sure. Sorry, I don't. You're mind fine. You know. You're fine. Do you mind if I make? Okay. Um, well, thank you for your um, the information you sent me. Uh, Jeremy on the uh, legislative things. I mean, I'm not, so when I'm, when I'm making comments to city council, I'm like, I don't know where to start. Like there's a lot of bad stuff, but that's how I feel about in general. But what I was going to say, one thing that just an idea, and I don't know if you guys are interested in this, but I'm going to throw it out there before, before the pandemic hit, at least on the health board. Um, what we used to do is we used to have, um, have a topic as like we would say, okay, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Grace, but like, uh, Grace, this, this week, you know, you pick a topic around energy and conservation and that just re do look, read a recent research paper and give us a five minute thing on that. Like, you know, I mean, I think that we, we could incorporate something like 
just researching a topic, you know? So, I mean, like my topic was for the health board was how climate change um, actually affects um, public health and, you know, more mosquitoes breeding and all these other things. So it, that, that's a rabbit hole, but um, I think it's kind of a, it could be an interesting idea. So I'm just gonna throw that out there as a possibility as we move forward. Yeah, it's a good idea. Sounds good. We'll good. talk about it during our comments because we can talk about anything. Good, good. Um, Chris, can we jump into yeah. the legislative update? Yeah, I, I was just seeing a, a bee left and then came back. I wonder if she's having some problems connecting. Aviva, is, okay. is your connection working out there? Sorry. Um, it must be on twice, getting a little feedback. My uh, Wi-Fi at school is kind of funky, so I had to leave and join again. Gotcha. Yeah. No All right. Uh, sorry, Jeremy and Michael, please. All right. Um, my plan was to go over and hopefully everybody received the PDF file that was sent out that has the legislative update it came out last week, Friday, I believe, and then also came out with the agenda for today's meeting and the minutes from last month and things like that. So um, my plan was to go through four bills, actually five bills, the, the four worst, and then one other bill that I wanted to highlight. Um, and Michael, as we go through this process, please don't hesitate to jump in you know, as well as anybody else, if there are questions or thoughts or any additional information that you want to add, don't hesitate to jump in. No problem. Thanks, Jeremy. Awesome. So first item I wanted to mention is that the city of Missoula government has taken a position of opposing all four of these first bills, which is awesome. And which I think we should um, celebrate that and, uh, you know, feel good that Missoula city government is actively opposing these four bills. And I'm not sure the particulars on the fifth, but we can, uh, we can talk about that when we get to it. The second thing that is constantly running through my brain that I would like you all, everyone to think about is what can we do as a committee or what can we do as individuals to actively oppose these pieces of legislation. So as we're going through and talking about it, think about what you can do, what we can do as a team to, you know, hopefully stop all, or if not all, at least most of these very dangerous and uh, potentially very harmful bills um, that we're going to talk about. Yeah, I'll jump For in a quick second, Jeremy. Sorry, just, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to bust your flow. But, um, no, this not is just So the group understands that Jeremy and I understand that as a team, what our actions are, are pretty much limited to talking to, uh, referring uh, what we see as appropriate steps to take to the uh, conservation team or conservation uh, committee for the city. Uh, and then our individual actions are gonna be something that we can be a lot more wide ranging about. Right, right, completely agree. So the first bill is Senate Bill 257. If you're looking at that PDF, it's the first one on page one. This bill specifically limits the ability of a local government from enacting a policy that would affect carbon use. So if there were fees or taxes or penalties or something that limits carbon use, um, this bill would restrict that. And this certainly would have a huge impact on Missoula's pursuit and our pursuit of 100% clean electricity. Um, there's some other things in that bill, but from an energy and climate perspective, that is where the focus is and essentially stopping any local government, whether that's Missoula or Whitefish or Billings or Great Falls or any entity from, um, from doing something that is going to restrict or limit uh, carbon use. So that's the first one. The second one is House Bill 448, and that's also on page one. It's the bottom section there of page one. Um, this is a bill, I don't, you may have seen in the Missoulian early this week, I believe it was Monday or Tuesday, 
Andrew Valanis, who is the head of MREA, or Montana Renewable Energy Association. He had an editorial about this particular bill. And just a little bit of history on this, MREA is the organization that was the architect of this original bill. And what this did originally is it would allow schools and libraries and small businesses to expand their solar um, capabilities. So I believe the limit previously was 50 kilowatts and that would have been expanded to 80 with the use of this House Bill 448. However, this bill has recently been hijacked by um, Northwestern Energy and anti-solar interests. And unfortunately, it's kind of taken the bill in the exact opposite direction. So this bill, as it is currently written, would require that the Public Service Commission or the Montana PSC um, change rates for solar customers. So as a solar customer generates more energy that they need, when that energy goes back to Northwestern Energy and gets pushed back to the grid, the rate that they are compensated or paid for that solar would be changed. And that would ultimately end up with a smaller benefit to a solar customer. Secondly, um, there would be additional checks that would, so for a solar customer, there would be additional checks that that individual or that business needs to do to have their system maintained and checked. Solar systems are not something that need a lot of um, regular maintenance, things like that. So this is simply one more way to add a fee, add an expense that would oftentimes involve non-solar um, installers that would not help the solar businesses, the solar industry here in Montana. Once again, adding additional cost to having a solar system on your roof or close by and making it much more difficult for that solar investment to pay for itself. And totally agree with Jeremy on this one. And just uh, for especially our students there too, they, um, I'm a regulator with the health department, so I'm fully behind regulations to protect people's safety. But in this case, uh, as Jeremy was just talking about, solar is a pretty um, hands-off operation once it's in place. If you have an inverter in place, then that changes the flavor of the electricity that's being pulled in by the solar panel uh, to what's going back out onto the grid. So it's, there's really no danger there that any qualified electrician couldn't handle. And so by requiring um, these specific people to be working on this, it's really kind of an onerous uh, prospect at a time when uh, the same people who are promoting this uh, seem to be trying to reduce onerous um, oversight on everything else. Yeah, very true, very true. The third piece of legislation that I wanted to touch on is at the top of page two. This is Senate Bill 379 and about a week ago, maybe maybe even two weeks ago, there was quite a large piece in the Missoulian as well and other local news organizations that talk specifically about Senate Bill 379. I thought there was an interesting comment that was made by, um, I don't remember who it was with Northwestern Energy, but the comment was that if Senate Bill 379 does not pass, Coal Strip may be closing here within four to five years because lots of other utilities, especially utilities in Washington State, have pulled out of Coal Strip or in the process of pulling out of Coal Strip, um, especially here in the next three to four years. With Senate Bill 379, if this particular bill passes, it is quite likely that Coal Strip could remain open for multiple decades. And Northwestern Energy could take additional ownership in Coal Strip. One of the big rubs, and there's 
there's lots of folks that have spoken out in the media in opposition to um, Senate Bill 379, including public service commissioners. The Montana PSC is opposed to this bill. Additionally, um, public service commissioners that are no longer serving but have served over the past 20 to 30 years have also spoken out in opposition to this bill. Um, this particular bill adds to the expense that individual customers would pay on a monthly basis, on a yearly basis. And what that does is it takes the expense for maintaining coal strip, for keeping it running, for reopening certain portions of the plant, and puts it on the back of Northwestern Energy customers, even though burning coal at this time is not the most efficient way to create energy, it's not the cleanest way, and it's certainly not the least expensive way to generate electricity as well. The dollar amount that actually gets calculated out is in excess of $700 per year per customer. So just thinking about myself and our family, thinking about what we pay on an energy bill, to think of that going up by over $700 per year per customer is a, uh, is a huge increase um, and has all kinds of downstream impacts that, um, that are scary and uh, terrifying, I should say. You know, I try to think of words to describe this in addition to the other bills. And it's just, uh, it's horrifying. Yeah. Michael? And, uh, yeah, and uh, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, just real quick, um, to put a little perspective on this too, to bring it home a little more uh, and for the students, it, you hear a lot about from our country what China is or is not doing uh, and what we are doing or not doing as a result of that. And China is closing coal plants as fast as they can. They used to be the world's leading uh, country on developing new coal plants, but they have totally gone in the other direction now because they recognize that coal is a past technology uh, and alternative energy generation is the future. Uh, whereas here, we're trying to hang on to 1800s technology uh, to move into the future. Uh, coal Strip was a town in Eastern Montana that has coal mines in it and coal processing plants. And the town was basically built around Coal Strip and those mines and the town kind of owed its soul to the coal mine. And as a result, the coal mine gave the townspeople a lot of money. But in a, a previous life of mine, I was a um, home oxygen therapist and I had a patient in Coal Strip who was dying of mesothelioma because he worked in the mines uh, with coal. And I can tell you, he was not at all pleased that the coal company had never told him that working in that mine could eventually lead to his death. And so what this bill is actually trying to do now is um, keep this coal generating facility going that is actually poisoning the people in the town that it is in, rather than trying to shut this down or move it into a, a, a new energy profile that would be something sustainable uh, that would actually help the people of that town over the long term, rather than continuing to see their town destroyed and potentially destroying the people in it. A scary, scary prospect for sure. The fourth bill that I wanted to touch on is at the bottom of page two, and this is Senate Bill 260. You may have also seen this in the media, um, commonly referred to as the takings bill. So this has an impact on energy and climate. This also has an impact on other types of businesses and industries in the state. Um, in particular, this bill would allow a business or a corporation to sue the state of Montana if they believe that their property was devalued by 25% or more. So as we talk about air pollution, sorry, one of the things I should have mentioned in that previous statement is that if their property is devalued by 25% as the result of a rule or regulation from the state of Montana. So if the state of Montana sets a limit on pollution and emissions, and as a result, a business feels like their 
um, their property, their value has declined by 25% or more, they can then go through a process of suing the state of Montana and being compensated for that reduction in their, um, in their value, in their earnings, in their property. This is scary, not only from the perspective of water quality, air quality, energy generation, but also, you know, can have implications as it pertains to hunting licenses and fishing licenses. There's multiple people talking about you know, if the state of Montana limits the amount of tags that are available in a certain area, does this bill make Montana liable to a hunting outfitter or a fishing outfitter for a stream or a river that is closed to fishing? Kind of those implications, which not only impact energy and climate, but also have very far reaching impacts um, throughout the state. And it's from a financial perspective, this can could bankrupt the state of Montana. This could have just incredible implications um, from a fiscal perspective as well, because the, the tentacles of this reach throughout not only local government, state government, and corporations and businesses and beyond. Michael, do you want to touch on this or does anybody want to add anything? I, I would just say it's interesting that this same privilege wasn't extended to the eight recognized tribal reservations in Montana, but it is being um, uh, handed out to businesses. Right, right, right. The, the fifth piece of legislation that I just wanted to touch on is actually on page five. If you have that document on your computer, um, this is House Bill 273. So once again, page five, it's on a, a lower priority House bill. This particular bill affects the siting of nuclear facilities. So as we are talking about the transition from coal-fired power plants to something that is less harmful to the environment, if we're talking about solar or wind or something like that. One of the discussions that's going on, not only in Montana, but in lots of other states as well, is does nuclear provide an option to generate electricity, generate energy that can take the place of coal and other um, carbon intensive energy development. So this particular bill would limit the ability, limit the right for the public to weigh in on both positive and negative um, feelings as far as nuclear energy. And that's specifically House Bill 273, um, which is also a, uh, a scary proposition. Amber, I'm not sure if the city of Missoula has taken a particular stand on House Bill 273 or not. Um, I don't know either. I don't, I don't think so, but I, I'm not positive. Okay. So the original question that I asked at the beginning of our discussion about the Montana legislature and what Michael um, underscored with some of his comments is what can we do as individuals and what can we do as a committee to further work to block or oppose or vote down um, these particular bills. I just wanted to open it up to the floor, questions, comments, thoughts, as well as any um, information on any of the five bills that we didn't highlight just now. Great Trevor, summary, looks, Jeremy, thank you. Oh, Michael, thank you for uh, adding in some important, uh, important information there as well. Trevor, it looks like your hand is up. And then Brian, uh, Brian is after Trevor. Yeah, so it's, um, I would just say doing some research on um, with the being able to sue the, in basically Montana for those resources. I think it also goes hand in hand with there's a bill out there to allow outfitters to be designated 
an X amount of tags as well for out of state. And um, so if, if you're, you know, broader than just um, environmental, but some of the conservation issues, I think those two bills are kind of hand in hand and they are uh, not very popular from what I know with con conservation groups in, in and around. Trevor, Montana. do you know which, Trevor, do you know which bill that is? I'm trying to find it right now. I didn't okay. even, I just know like Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, I think came out against it. Um, okay. And so and, what you're saying is, is that bill would allow hunting and fishing outfitters to, or hunting outfitters to have a specific number of tags that are yeah. earmarked for out of state Yeah. People? So the, I mean, there's with this bill and so I think one of the broader fears like you brought up too is if they both, it could just, it's just something worth if you want to look into, I would look into that one as well. I'll try to find it uh, when I have some time because I think they kind of go hand in hand because then if they're designated X amount of tags, right? And then this other bill passes and then something in the future allows that to be restricted, then they have recourse because you're, you're taking from these outfitters business um, and then I was just going to say with the nuclear, um, uh, bill, do we know like, what's the purpose of that? Is that because they think that the only way to be able to get nuclear energy into the state would be to bypass a public vote or is it, uh, to keep the public from wanting to allow it? Do we know, or, cause I mean, other than the argument for taking away from civil liberties it's it just seems like an interesting uh, move on their part of right, like what's the right. purpose it's an interesting way to suppress public voices i don't right. trevor i don't have any specific um background as far as the particular reasoning behind that bill amber did you leave it looks like Amber has jumped off for another call. Michael, do you have any thoughts on the nuclear bill in answer to Trevor's question? So I, I don't um, I don't have direct proof. Um, the discussion around it has been a, as we all know, it's just another uh, piece of the pie of a push to eliminate alternative, uh, sustainable alternative energy generation sources. Um, unfortunately, nuclear has kind of been folded into the um, the picture for the transition to a full alternative en energy um, electric network uh, because it would be an uh, an easy. It's even actually been called green, which just kills me that they call nuclear energy a green source, but. Um, uh, it's been folded in as a, a transition uh, away from carbon-based fuels towards uh, fully alternative energy. Uh, and more specifically, Brian might have more information about this too, is that I know Northwest Energy has kind of always wanted to uh, work on nuclear power generation uh, here in Montana, given lots of space and, and uh, lots of mountains to, bur to burrow into to bury nuclear waste. So. Right. Megan, I just got a text message from Amber that she is at the meeting, but she I think she might be in the waiting room or she can't talk. Megan, are you able to resolve that? Thank you. I just allowed her to speak. Amber, is that working? No. OK. Hmm. Amber, are you there? I see that somebody has joined from a telephone number. That won't let me promote her to a panelist from the telephone, but I did allow talking. Let me disable and re-enable. Can you guys? Oops. Amber, are you there? Sorry, Amber, try again. I disabled you right as you started talking. Okay, am I here? Yes, we can hear you, Amber. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry about that drama. I just need to be in the car. So I wanted to um, join. I missed some of that, but I'm, I'm here. Amber, one of, 
I guess before you have to jump off, I am curious if you have any thoughts about the most effective way for our team to amplify our voice, either as a committee or individually as well. And I know, Brian, you have your hand up as well. Yeah, so one of the things um, I was thinking when you were talking earlier, uh, first of all, I just want to say that I'm, I'm really thankful for all the work you guys have put into this. This is amazing and it's been really helpful for me um, trying to track and understand some of these. Um, but uh, I, I think that as a committee and as um, a city committee, I think that for as long as you're following the positions that the city has taken, I don't think we as a committee of the city can um, take positions on things that the city has not taken a position on, right? I, I mean, I think, um, so that's the first thing. Uh, as individuals, like um, someone pointed out, I, I think you can do whatever, <laughs> whatever you want. And I'm, re you know, I do some legislative work um, with a separate hat uh, on than, uh, than a city council person. And so I'm kind of trying to walk that line myself all the time. Um, so, you know, I, I think it, it, to me, what we do in our other legislative stuff is trying to figure out knowing exactly where the bill is and knowing what committee it's in and what legislators you can contact, right? Like, I, I don't know, what, I was reading through that and I'm not sure when it says it's in committee, what committee it's on, but certainly if there are legislators, um, local legislators or, you know, contacting them or sending them, sending the whole committee a letter signed by the committee. I mean, those are kind of the general things that I could talk more, uh, Jeremy and Chris, when we meet individually, I'm happy to talk out a little more of, of the strategy around that. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Amber. Thank you. Thank you. Brian, you've had your hand up for a long time. Yeah, thank you, Jeremy. Um, my comment kind of passed its time, uh, but um, I just wanted to add a little context to uh, some of the two of the bills that you mentioned, uh, SB 379 and SB 260. They're both, and there's another bill on your, that you didn't talk about, SB 201. They're all authored by Steve Fitzpatrick, um, legislator out of Great Falls. And I wanted to point out, and I thought this was true, but I saw it in print the other day, so I know it's true. Uh, Steve Fitzpatrick is uh, the son of John Fitzpatrick, which was a long time Northwestern Energy uh, legislator, not legislator, lobbyist, right. um, often considered one of the most effective lobbyists in, in the state. And uh, anyway, this is, I, I guess, his son trying to continue his, his father's legacy. Thank you, Brian. All right, Trevor, is your hand up or is that from previously? And I know, I know Virgil. Previous. Actually, Trevor, Trevor, did you have another thought or? No, it's previous. I didn't lower okay. it. Sorry. No worries. Virgil, your hand was up. Um, well, I was just trying to think of things that we could do um, to oppose these bills. Um, and I have known that um, you can send letters to um, officials at high enough levels um, of complaint and stuff. Um, I don't know if that would do much because these people, they're probably not going to listen to us, but um, we can do that and we can raise awareness probably um, with people in our community. Um, I guess there's, I don't know if there's, I don't, I'm not very experienced at this, so I don't know if there's much as a committee that we can do, but I think individually we can definitely like do our parts. Virgil, I completely agree with you. I think that when people speak up and voice their concern, I think sometimes it is pushed to the side, but I think sometimes it is absolutely recognized. And, you know, I think there are dozens of instances where one person speaks up in a creative way, in an effective way, and it makes a whole host of difference. So I count me in as agreeing that I think Virgil. that indi individuals can definitely make a difference. Virgil, I would add, and I'm, I'm sorry, 
sorry to interrupt. I can't, I can't, I don't know how to raise my hand now. Um, but Virgil, I, I really appreciate those comments and I think that's exactly true. And kind of where I was going with, uh, my comment is, you know, it does make a difference when you hear from constituents, you know, as, as an elected person myself, I, I think it's really important when I hear, you know, if I hear from someone from Billings that wants us to keep masks on, that doesn't feel as compelling as if someone in Missoula is telling me keep have people keep their masks on or whatever it is. So I, I absolutely think that um, that legislators respond to that, but I think it's definitely more effective when it's uh, someone that they are elected to represent. Good, good. Grace, your hand is up and then Michael after Grace. Yeah, thank you. So I, along the lines of kind of just everything we've been talking about, um, I want to clarify one point. So I think Amber had mentioned that um, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if the city hasn't taken a stance on a particular bill, then we as a committee cannot. And I'm curious how that um, would interplay with the possibility of um, how Virgil mentioned, like, raising awareness and um, the possibility for like, I don't know, public relations um, in opposition to these bills. Um, and I don't know if that's something that's within the capacity of this team, but um, yeah, I was just curious how that would all work together. Amber, do you want to touch on that? Yeah, so I mean, I think, thanks, Grace. Wait, who is that? I'm sorry, I can't tell who that was. It kind of sounded like Grace, so maybe it was. Yeah. It was Grace. Um, yeah. Okay, okay. I thought it was you, but I can't see anymore. Um, so, I mean, I think that, I think that raising awareness, we, we need to coordinate with our lobbyists, for sure. I think that, uh, you know, raising awareness on bills that the city has taken a position on um, and asking, you know, I think there, there are all sorts of lobbying strategies that people use in hopes of, uh, you know, getting, 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 getting their uh, elected officials to vote the way they want them to vote. And so I, I think that, I think we could do that. Um, the one thing I do that by kind of raising awareness or doing some sort of campaign around that. The one thing I would say, um, you know, we are far into, because I'm working on other issues, um, we're far into the legislature. So, you know, they are, a transmittal has happened from the House to the Senate and from the Senate to the House. Um, they're still reviewing budget bills, but I, um, so as far as like making public comments, some of that, if it's out of committee, is already pretty limited. Um, but I still think we can contact people, I guess is my point. Did that, I don't know if that completely answered your question, but... There are some nuances there of things we can and we can't do. Right. And I think one of the other challenges is that a number of the legislators from Missoula have, not all, but a number of them have similar concerns about some of these bills. So I think part of our challenge is to reach out to those legislators that may not be from Missoula, but that may be considering voting in support of some of these bills to try and change their vote from support to oppose. Um, and certainly that can happen with some Missoula legislators, but also would happen with legislators, you know, in other parts of the state. And Amber, that kind of dovetails with your comment that, you know, if I'm talking to a Missoula legislator, it may be more effective than if I'm talking to a legislator from Whitefish or Great Falls or Billings um, and so on. So, Michael. Right. I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of our legislators are voting the direction we would want them to vote anyway. You know, not right. every single one. There are some that, you know, whose legislative districts run into Missoula that are um, also run into the Bitterroot and things like that. So there are some that kind of cross over um that may not be um how shall I, is, that may not be supporting the bills that that we're, we feel like they should be supporting so right i think there is some opportunity there right right okay we've got michael and then aviv and grace michael you're up uh, um my comment on that too was just uh you know, just because they're administrative 
uh, constraints on what it is we can do as a team. I don't want you guys, uh, the students, to feel like that our individual voices don't matter. They really do. The very makeup of this current legislature in Montana was all because there were a lot of loud, angry voices that got heard and people got elected that created this particular makeup uh, in how we get those people uh, out of there in an, another year uh, is by having a loud collective voice in the opposite and uh, expressing how displeased uh, people would be with this push towards not helping people and helping corporations instead. Uh, but I, I, I've got to jump off here, uh, Chris, get back to my health department job out in the field. But um, I sent you some information about the uh, youth team that uh, feel free to volunteer me for anything that happens there uh, uh, when you guys talk about that in a little bit. Um, but also just, uh, I'd like to make one passing last comment about Josh. Uh, in the time that Josh was on the team, I think he was a wonderful addition to our team. He had a great voice. He had a great way of looking at things. Uh, I'm very sorry that he couldn't be a part of the team anymore, but I do want to add that <clears throat> Uh, military sexual abuse uh, is rampant and it is a horrible problem that is not being addressed. Uh, most people in the military who have been sexually abused are treated as, not as the victim, but as people who are a problem uh, and they are ostracized and they are not given justice. So I really appreciate that Josh is taking on that task of, uh, of working on that. And it's not just women in the military, it's men and uh, gender fluid people as well. So I really appreciate the work that he's doing. And I'm glad he's given it his full attention now because it, it needs everybody who can. Thanks everybody, I appreciate it. Thanks Jeremy, <laughs> fantastic job. Thank you, Michael, we'll be in touch. Aviv, you are next. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, I wanted that to say first, sorry, I've uh, the connection here at my school is not doing too well today. So I've had to leave the meeting a few times. No um, worries. I, I know the connection at some other schools is bad too. So we, uh, we feel your pain. Yeah. Okay. And we're going to get money in the infrastructure bill for better broadband. That's <laughs> something I think regardless of party or any other views in Montana, we need better broadband. Just a little side note there. Sorry, Aviv. Go ahead. <laughs> You're good. Um, I was wondering though, if I were to write an email um, speaking out about these bills, who who would I um, send the email to or address? That's a, an excellent question. So it depends on the bill and it depends on where that bill is in the process. Um, the, the one approach that Amber was referring to is contacting your legislator. The depending on where you live, your legislator may already be, you know, in opposition to the bill, which a letter of the type that you're describing can definitely, you know, encourage them to remain opposed to the bill as we would want. The other option is to try to write a letter to somebody who is outside of your particular district, but yet in the general Missoula area and to specifically target legislators that may have a tendency to vote in support of that bill. Um, there's, a, there's a legislative database that the state of Montana runs and I can certainly send an email out. And part of me wants to try and do some extra digging to say, you know, here's five legislators that we should target or that we should focus on um, to encourage them to vote in opposition to this bill. Um, I don't know, do you guys think that would be helpful if we kind of targeted specific? I know Michael's not here anymore, so he can't weigh in. Do you guys think that would be helpful? Can I make a quick comment on that? I, I, yeah, I did. I feel like it would be a lot more effective if instead of spreading ourselves out, if we kind of focused on some people who might be willing to switch sides um, because we have a better chance of them. Yep. But, yep. Okay. So, Virgil, you're saying to target specific people that we think may vote in support of the bill and then try to. People who are kind of on the edge of either side. Right. Right. To tip to our, the side. Than voting against these bills. Um, right, right. Okay, I like it. I like it. Grace, you're up, and then Chris, you're next. 
Yeah, I just wanted to uh, keep talking about just the, the options we have as a team as opposed to as individuals for um, influencing um, the legislature. And so that I guess that's one option. So I'm not sure that my question totally uh, is valid anymore. But yeah, I'm just curious. Can anyone give me like a here are the three things we can do? We can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, as a committee, the things that we can do, number one is we can um, notify folks within the city of Missoula, which we have done. And we have a, a number of different folks that we've notified, including Amber Sherrill, city council representative who was here a short time ago, uh, Montana James and Charlotte Pissick, who both work in the department that Chris referred to earlier. And they're well aware of our opposition. Um, Diana Mineta works in Missoula County. She is also aware and is in agreement to oppose these um, top four bills, um, along with a lot of the other ones as well. Um, Jessica Miller is in the mayor's office. She knows about it as well, and they are also in opposition. So that's, that's kind of number one. Number two, something that we haven't really talked about a whole lot, but, you know, other entities have certainly done it before, where we write a letter to the Missoulian as a team and, you know, make the case in opposition to one of these bills or multiple of the bills. Um, and then number three is more of a, an individual item, but we can certainly act as individuals, emailing legislators, calling legislators, um, communicating through those channels as well. And I'm, I'm sure there's other other ways that we can try to influence the vote as well. Chris, you're up and then Ellis and then Brian. Yeah, a little more on that, Grace is uh, <clears throat> one of the ones that Amber mentioned to Jeremy and I is um, when we bring these forward to, to Amber and then they get forwarded to the city council and they get discussed because they're on the, uh, on the agenda item, um, then people who are watching the city council meeting, and there's quite a few of them, can learn about the bill. So certainly one of the main elements of our, of our team has, is, is outreach and education. Um, we don't do as much of that because we're getting more involved in specific projects, but that's in our mandate. So how does that look besides some of the things that already been mentioned? We can hold public meetings. You know, uh, we can put out... Uh, uh, MCAT videos. Um, one of the things that we've been wanting to do forever is improve our, 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 our net um, internet uh, uh, experience, you know, create a, a website that, that would work to, to allow us to put information out there. So there, there's a lot of things uh, that we can do. And again, especially if the city op op or opposes it or, or, you know, whatever, and we have the same thing, that kind of gives us a little bit of a, of a leeway to, to dig in a little bit. And, and I don't know that we can't contact a legislator and say, I am with this city board and we oppose this bill versus me, Chris, uh, Joe Citizen. Uh, we haven't done that, but you know, it's, I think one worth talking about because if we're in alignment with the city and they've already got a, a lobbyist who's doing this very thing. We're paying that lobbyist to do what the city government wants us to do. We're part of the city government in this way. We may be able to go that far. Um, right. The other, to, to get back to uh, an earlier one as to how to reach out to legislators specifically, you know, um, I like the idea of targeting uh, uh, legislators who may be on the bubble on this uh, in specific members of the committees that these bills are in. I think that's where this really can be the biggest part. So, so when you look and you say, okay, we're at the, you know, the, the house energy committee and there's, you know, eight members and the two of them are on the West slope, you know, and it, not even looking at party, just looking at people that may oppose or support. And then the other way to look at this is when you send it to them, oftentimes, you know, 
it's it's the unintended consequences of these bills that really get you. The idea that we're trying to reduce, you know, uh, the the net metering uh, 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 payback is one thing, because you know there's a legitimate political financial goal to that, you know. But what you target is how these bills are so imp- poorly written, so poorly organized that there will be unintended consequences that that what the goal of the bill is will not be reached by this law. It's interesting and uh, I moved from here from Colorado and they do lots and lots and lots of citizens initiatives and some of them sound great, but you get in and you realize the bill was written poorly and, and it could lead to these other things or it, 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 it's not going to meet the objectives that the, that the bill states. And so, uh, particularly when you're talking to folks who might otherwise support it, you really go after the failures of the legislation to do what it's intended to do and not the cause itself, because they already support the cause, but they should vote against it because it's just a really poorly written bill. Right. Thank you, Chris. Brian, you're up next. Thanks, Jeremy. I, I guess I wanted to throw out one other, I, I guess, last ditch option for uh, advocacy for or against bills, and that is is the governor. You you can write to the governor, and I know the governor's not exactly in in the type of uh, progressive camp that that most of us are, but um, he is elected by all the people, so all our voices count uh, in, in his accounting. Whereas maybe you know a, a legislature. Uh, House member, Senate member that is not in our district may may shun our, our pleas for advocacy, um, but the governor has has a more uh, invested uh, approach, I guess, to to listen. Whether he acts on that or not is, is but you know, if, if there's a whole ton of public outrage about it, you know, right. Yeah, thank you, Brian. I uh, I agree. I think public outrage is very um, can be very vocal and can be very influential. So, Ellis or Aviv, did you have your hand up? I thought somebody else had their hand up. I had it up, but uh, yeah, lowered it. Okay. One of the um, one of the things that I personally have found very effective when communicating with a legislator is to have some sort of a personal story that is meaningful. So if I have a family member who was impacted or I have something that allows me to connect with the legislator so that the legislator cannot just dismiss it as, oh, this is just another person writing a form letter that I'm going to ignore. You know, the the extra five minutes or the extra 10 minutes to make that letter personalized, to tell a personal story, whether that's a story that involves renewable energy, that tells a story that involves, um, you know, water quality, air quality, things like that. I think that connection can be effective, a connection between the person writing the letter and the legislator or the governor that is receiving the letter so that they truly understand there's a human behind this letter. It's not just a blanket statement that is sent off to a thousand different people, but is, is kind of a personal, a personal element. So... Okay, so what what I'm hearing is that it would be helpful for us to know which legislators would be good to contact and how we can most effectively do that, including the governor, including legislators, and maybe target. um, What I can try to do this weekend with Michael's help, if uh, if he's able to help, Um, is to look at some of these bills, see which legislators may be in committee, maybe on the bubble, as we were describing before, and see if there's a group of folks that we can 
speak to. And the other thing that I think is very powerful for any youth team members to use your youth as an advantage, because oftentimes legislators are very familiar with hearing from the 65, 75, 85 year old people that are retired and are happy to write letters and happy to send emails. But it's a, at least from my impression, it's a far less frequent experience for a legislator or the governor to hear from a 15 year old old student or a 19 year old student. Um, And I think that can be very, very powerful. Grace and Ellis. Grace, you're up first. Thanks. I have kind of a two-part question. Uh, My first part is, what is the timeline for these bills that we're looking at? I know they're kind of in different places, but um, can you give me a general sense of how long we have to engage? You know, that's an excellent question. I don't, I'm going to try to look up right now when the session ends. I know they changed the session so they're not working on Saturdays, but are working longer into the session. If anybody knows that, um, actually what I'm, what I'm showing is May 1st. Nope, sorry, that's not the right calendar. So that's I right. don't, it, it adjourns May 1st, 2021. May that's the first. first date. Okay. So, so yeah, so, so time is of the essence. So in, in the sense, if you don't mind me jumping in, so yeah. th- there's the process of committees. So once it gets out of a committee, it, it, it may have two votes in a committee and it may be assigned to other committees or it may go directly to the floor, at which point, it will be, you know, voted on, and then it still has to go over to the other side. If it starts in the House, it has to go to the Senate. So now it's over in the Senate, and it's going to start over in a committee unless it gets assigned directly to the floor. So, um, so right now these committees, you know, they're trying to meet. They got lots of stuff going on. It goes back and forth, and you know, the death nail of these things is not is not the vote. It's getting stuck in committee. It doesn't come out of committee, or it gets signed to three other committees. And so it's funny, it's not, lots of times we'll never get to the vote on these things. You, you wanna kill them by, by slowing the process down or get them assigned to committee. So uh, it's just kind of funny that way. But so, so it, it, you know, if it makes it out of this committee and it makes it to the house and then they vote on it and then it still has to go to a committee on the Senate side and then they have to vote on it. This is where this May 1st starts pushing up against the wall. And this is why the vast, vast majority of legislation does not pass partly because it's not very good, but usually because they we're just simply going to run out of time. And uh, so only a handful of all the bills that are proposed will be voted on, and even a subset of those will be passed. Grace, did that answer your first question? And maybe you have yeah, a second one? I do. Um, so knowing that, um, do we as a group have a desire and or the ability to do some public outreach, both like legally and also just like, do people have time to do this? Um, For example, um, I don't remember who, someone mentioned writing to the Missoulian as a group. Um, I don't know if this is allowed, but I could do some social media work if we wanted to do, I don't know if that's possible, but um, do we have interest in starting public outreach? I, I personally think that these bills are very harmful. And I think if we can do public outreach that we have not done in the past, I think more power to it. And I think we should work to embrace methods that we maybe have not used in the past. Does anybody else have thoughts about additional public outreach? It's again, it, it comes right, it comes right in our bylaws um, as to who we are and what we do. And so, and in those bylaws, it specifically talks about um, engaging in, uh, in 
with community outreach. And so it's a, uh, it, the climate team is to aid in the community-wide education and communication of energy efficiency opportunity, opportunities to minimize greenhouse gas generation, as well as advising the city council. So actually our primary goal, oddly enough, is outreach. And I would just add, I guess, for the younger folks, you'll learn as you get older, a lot of this stuff is gonna take a lot longer than maybe you would like. So, uh, you know, my thought is, you know, with COVID is, puts another restriction on us is my hope in this position. And as things change, um, you know, things will move a little more rapidly where maybe there is much more avenues for outreach. Um, but under current circumstances to get into those and coordinate and to figure those avenues out uh, does take a lot more effort in, in time consuming. So sometimes it just might go slower. So um, you know, absolutely. I think a lot of us would be open to those things, or at least myself. Um, it's just for my personal personality and things of that nature, a lot more so when I'm able to interact with people in person. Thank you, Trevor. Ellis, you have your hand up, and Brian after Ellis. Sorry, again, people just keep. Um, answering my questions. So I just forgot to put that down. Sorry. No worries. No worries. It's all good. Brian, you're up next. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Grace, uh, you mentioned, I, I think that's a great idea that you had. Uh, what were you thinking, like using your own personal accounts or having uh, an official account? And what accounts like Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter? I, I don't know. What, what were your ideas there? Can you elaborate? Yeah, of course. So I think um, I'm happy to use, so, I, okay, this is a little confusing. So I have like a personal account. I also have an account that I just made recently for an, another environmental thing that I do my, that I, or I haven't done much, but I plan to, I don't know, let's say put commentary on environmental issues on that uh, as an Instagram account. Um, I think if, I'm happy to use that for these purposes, but I think, um, if we are speaking like as a team, as a committee, I think we should probably have our own accounts um, just to differentiate. Um, I know how to operate Instagram. I am completely lost on other <laughs> um, social media sites. I'm sure I could figure them out with the help of my fellow Gen Z members here. But um, so I'm happy to set those up if we want to do that. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, make all of our posts and um, promote it to the community and such. Um, I could see posting about, um, well, about our meetings, if people want to come to them, uh, about city council meetings, about the actual bills, about actions people can take to whatever end to support or oppose um, the bills. It's, I'm, I see it as a way of just spreading the information because at least in my peer group, we all know stuff is happening, but we don't know what's happening or how to find it or how to impact it. So I think um, that's where I think social media specifically could be helpful. It's basically what the newspaper used to be, but for yep. us, yeah. Yep. So what, what do you guys think about having an Instagram account that is the energy and climate team for Missoula, Montana, and using that to um, oppose these pieces of legislation and also to notify folks about an upcoming meeting. Chris, I think you're muted. Um, and not that I'm gonna comment too far on it. I just wanna say that um, this, all, this, should, this should probably be an item that we put on it as agenda item and discuss further because it's a big deal and it has some implications uh, to our to our mandate. And uh, and as as people have said, we've been wanting to do it, but we haven't. But trying to you know figure out the rules, like I'm looking at a zero by fifty web page right now, and it's called zero by fifty missoula.com. So zero by fifty is a formal and a, a project program under the city of Missoula. And yet there's a web page here 
then I can't tell who puts it up. There is a contact and the contact is somebody from home resource. And you're like, now who does this? Who is this? And I, and I happen to know that it was actually, uh, I believe it's Climate Smart Missoula, but so we have to be careful. Like uh, we've got, when you, when you create these web presences or, 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 or uh, other types of presidents, presidents in, uh, in social media, you, you, you need to, it, it's gotta be done in a way that it's transparent, it's clear, we follow all our own rules, you know, so there's, there's a, a more discussion. I think in the short term, we can use it, you know, I can use mine, um, you can use yours, um, and we can reach out that way and even say, hey, I'm part of this, this committee, this team, and our committee has opposes this for these reasons. You can do that today and say you're part of the team. Sorry. And I can, one of the other things that I think would be interesting is to, so if we have a group of legislators that we're targeting, um, to f see if they are on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and then target them from that perspective as well. Because sometimes legislators don't thoroughly read their emails. And if we have a short, catchy, um, clever reason to vote no on one of these pieces of legislation, and it gets sent on to someone's Instagram account, um, I think that can be very powerful, as, as you've indicated. So... Grace. Thank you. Um, follow up question. I think I asked this earlier, but I don't remember the answer. So if the city of Missoula hasn't taken an official position on the House legislature bills and such, can we publicly do that? We I feel like we need to ask that question to Amber. Okay. So I so Grace, in more specifically to answer your question, if you think House Bill 123 is a bad bill, then you absolutely can, you know, say that on your own Twitter, Instagram, Facebook page, but not as, you know, not as the energy and climate team. For these four bills that we're talking about where the city of Missoula has clearly stated that they are in opposition to these four bills, you can say on your Instagram account, you can say, I serve as a member of, you know, a youth team member on the energy and climate team. And these bills or this bill in particular is in opposition, you know, this does not support energy conservation and climate action. That's my interpretation. If anybody disagrees, feel free to uh, correct me. Okay, so seeing that there's no more comments, the action items that I have, number one is this weekend, I'm gonna to pull together a list of legislators that we should target for these specific pieces of legislation and also update this spreadsheet specifically with these top four um, because the information that we were looking at today is as of April 1st, and I'll update that with any changes that have occurred over the last week. I will share that out by Monday at the latest. And Grace, you're going to do some posting on Instagram. Is that correct? Yes. Would you like me to um, create an account or are we waiting to put this on the agenda for the next I think we need to wait to put okay. this on our next meeting agenda. Okay. I'll do some personal posting. Then. So for right now, we can do some personal posting. If anybody else wants to post it on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, et cetera, you certainly can. Um, as well as we can email legislators. We can call legislators. We can contact legislators through the Montana um, legislation websites and things like that. Um, MEIC has a meeting each Thursday at five o'clock. MEIC is the Montana Environmental 
Information Council, something like that. I forget exactly what MEIC specifically stands for. Um, but they, and I will send that link out as well, because at five o'clock each Thursday, they have a Zoom meeting and they help to share information about the bills, but they also help to share how can you have your voice heard? How can you communicate with the legislators either by sending an email or speaking up in the legislature via Zoom or remote? So um, any other action items that I have not specified? I guess I should include, and then we all take it upon ourselves to reach out to legislators um, so that we target specific legislators to oppose these bills. Grace. Sorry, one more question. Um, do we, uh, we talked about this, about writing to the Missoulian potentially. Is that something, I, I'm happy to draft something if we are interested in that. Right, right. Team, what do you think? Trevor, it looks like you have your hand up. Uh, well, mine was the add on to Grace or any of the, the students. I, if the other board members aren't opposed, I would be interested also if you, in your social um, networks and things, maybe solicit feedback on how we can engage with going forward with those younger crowds, because it seems like many of you have mentioned that the protest was uh, a big motivating factor for all of you in changing your thinking. So how can we as a board get better engagement when we do figure out ways that we can do education pieces and things? Because doesn't do very much good if we only got, you know, two people we're engaging with. If we can engage with a larger group at a time, it, it's much more powerful. So I'd, I'd just be very curious if you, you or followers and whatnot have um, ideas on how to create that engagement. Right, right. Grace, in answer to your question earlier, as far as writing a letter to the Missoulian, here's what I think would be most impactful. And everyone's welcome to, you know, agree or disagree, certainly. I think what's most impactful in this scenario is to have a letter that comes from the youth team members of our committee that is supported by the entire committee, but is actually written by the youth team members. You know, and I would be happy to review it or, you know, look over it. But I think people respond when youth team members take initiative, take leadership and express concern or support for something that's going on in our community. So I'm not trying to throw anybody out there or anything like that. But I do think that a letter that comes from the youth team members of the energy and climate team that is supported by the energy and climate team would be very impactful and a lot of people would, um, would pay close attention to it. And I'm also open to anybody's differing opinions or disagreements. I like that idea and would be happy to engage on that. So. Awesome. Yeah, I agree. I really like that idea. I think it could make an impact. Yeah. I think I agree too. That sounds really nice. I think it'll be really important and impactful. Awesome. Chris, Brian, Trevor. I like uh, it. Yeah. I have one suggestion, which I, and I don't know how y'all feel about it, but maybe finding a uh, reading, you know, we all had kind of a sample with your application of your writing where um, maybe having someone in the mid-level write it because it has that level of they are youth where Grace, uh, you know, this is a compliment. You, your writing comes across much more as an adult um, and that's just the nature of the education level you all have. Um, and so that'd just be my two cents. If you're gonna go that route, um, maybe have it, the main person writing it be uh, one of the middle educated or, you know, grade levels, if that makes sense. Sure. And I think 
I think it certainly could be a team effort. Yeah. You know, between Virgil, Aviv, LS, Grace. Um, the other the other reason that I think it is impactful is I think the Missoulian and or any other news outlet that we approach, I think, you know, they they get more letters from 45 year olds than they do from 18 year olds. I'm, I'm just going to go out on a limb and say that that's at least that's my strong impression. And so I think the likelihood that it gets published coming from a group of 15 to 19 year olds is stronger than if it comes from a group of 45 to 65 year olds. And I, obviously I don't know everybody's age, either youth team members or adults. So I'm just throwing numbers out there from that perspective. Um, uh, sorry, so go ahead, Grace. Okay, thanks. Um, I, Aviv just lost connection, so maybe this isn't the right time to ask this, but are we, can we as youth team members have our own meeting? Is that, does that work? Yeah, I was, was going to get, I was going to get into this a little bit because <clears throat> we're not taking any formal action today because there was no formal action on the agenda to take. Remember, anytime we take formal action, it has to be published in advance and given an opportunity for anybody who is interested to comment on that. And then that action is published through our minutes afterwards. We have, we have to follow these rules. So um, one of the ways we, we work within the rules is we are allowed to have work groups. And work groups can develop products, they can discuss things, they can go back and forth um, and, and are, are allowed to do that without being in violation of the public uh, uh, meeting laws. And so, yes, what I would recommend is that you guys create a work group. Um, and if you wanted one um, of the, uh, the adult, to use that word because I don't feel like an adult, but like Jeremy or Michael, somebody who understands this uh, to to assist or to provide input, um, that might not be a bad idea either. Chris, do you feel, so if, if there is a letter that's drafted, do you feel like it would be appropriate for us to have a meeting in two weeks to review that as a committee and then like quote unquote sign off on that? Or... <laughs> Let's just say, that? let's just say if it came from the youth team members or non-voting members of our team at working under a work group heading. Okay. So we know, don't need to have a, we don't need well, to have a meeting you know, in two weeks. Let's, let's not get too into the details there. Yep. This is, yep. this is less questions asked the better, but I, I, I think a work group yep. with one adult would be fantastic. Sounds good. Grace. Another question about public outreach. Um, I, um, through other environmental stuff, I have been in contact with various uh, reporters and things that have written um, articles about me and about the causes and groups and things. Is that um, something, is press something that could function in this group? And uh, is it appropriate to, um, solicit press coverage to the end of um, spreading awareness about these bills? Because I, I know the reporters is the point. <laughs> right, right. As far as communicating concern with regards to these four bills and, you know, expressing that to the Missoulian and beyond, I would say yes. I mean, I would certainly be open to other people's opinion, but I think absolutely. I think one of the best things that we can do as a team is to spread the word far and wide about the harmful impacts of these bills. <clears throat> uh, Brian. Yeah, I would definitely echo that. Um, I was going to suggest before that conversation came up is that you not just choose the Missoulian. I know that's our local paper, but you kind of preach into the choir, I'd say, using that. Yep. Um, yep. But, you know, I, I would reach out to really all the 
publications in, in the major cities across Montana. And I'm not sure that identifying your association with the Missoula Climate and Ener Energy and Climate Team would be a, a good thing <laughs> if you're trying to reach other markets. Um, true. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's something to consider, um, you know, especially in, in, in a more eastern Montana market. Um, you, you, you might affect more, more minds or get more reads without that kind of affiliation. Brian, you are absolutely correct that, you know, in some areas, when you say you're from Missoula and you're concerned about the environment or you're concerned about climate change, they automatically check out. Um, so Brian, your, your point is interesting. If the letter came from Grace, Ellis, Aviv, and Virgil, but was not associated with Missoula, it's a good question. I haven't thought about it from that perspective. When you could basically write the same letter in, in the Mizzou, when you submit one to the Missoula and just identify that you are part of the board because it would have weight here. Um, and then you could make a very small edit for the other publication and just basically removing that. Yeah. Yeah. What do you guys think? I feel like that's the kind of thing that we can kind of tease out. You know, we can kind of think about the best approach um, and kind of make a determination because that's not something we need to vote on right now. I would be interested, you know, just to think about that for a couple hours and see if Michael has input as well. Okay, so we need to form a work group of Grace, Ellis, Virgil, Aviv, and one or two older members um, and kind of uh, try to plan a time to get together. Is there a, recognizing that time is of the essence, is there a good day or time, Grace, Ellis, Virgil, and Aviv? Um. For me, I think the days, I don't, I have a pretty busy schedule, but especially I have gymnastics Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And so I, I mean, Aviv does too. We're in the same class. So we probably wouldn't be able to do those days. Would we want to try and work on this this weekend, do you think? Or is that too fast? I should definitely do this weekend. That'd be I best for me. Weekend. That's best for me probably too. Okay, maybe Saturday. What, and we could, and you know, we could arrange for a Zoom meeting. <laughs> Ellis, it looks like you have your hand up. Um, that was, sorry, regarding something else. <laughs> I, have, I need to get better with my hand raising. No um, worries, I should have seen it a long time ago. Uh, the, in terms of this weekend, something that would possibly work better. Um, but I think later in the day, Saturday, if we were to do it just in terms of timing, so I'm not sure if. Yeah, I, I work at five. Okay, so yeah. Saturday at like three o'clock, 3.30? Yeah. Virgil Aviv, what do you think? That, I think that would work for me. Um, oh. Yeah, I don't have much going on on the weekends. Okay, and a Zoom meeting? Okay, um, I am happy to be involved, but I also don't wanna self-nominate myself, so to speak. Um, I think Michael would be a great person to have involved. Obviously, since he's not here, we can't uh, volunteer him. Um, but Actually, I think you can because he, before he left, he said, you can volunteer me for anything. It's yeah. true, it's true. So Why let's, Brian or Trevor or Chris, do any of you guys want to be involved or? You, you guys are the experts on the legislative end of things. So uh, I defer to you and Michael uh, to the extent that you guys know a lot better what's going on. Yeah, I'm happy okay. to help, but I, I don't know if I would be much of a help. So if you guys 
editing or any of that type of stuff or ideas or you know broader stuff I'm happy to engage in whatever way needed okay so let's plan on Saturday at three o'clock I will send out a zoom link um, just from a personal zoom account that I have and we can uh, we can chat on Saturday at three o'clock and I will connect with Michael today and hopefully he's able to participate Saturday at three o'clock. I'm excited. This is good. Well, excellent, Chris, Jeremy. Thank Chris, you. I don't think I left much time for six two and six three. So sorry <laughs> no, about that. No, that would we. Yeah, I, I expected just a a quick review of where we're at, but yeah, we're down to the wire. I was just counting. It's twenty two days left. To the end of the legislative session so we are down to the wire and these are some bills that do not help us reach our goal of of uh, carbon neutrality uh, and so that's why we 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 oppose them specifically because that's specifically our job and we do that through energy conservation education and uh promoting uh, renewable energy um so i think that's fantastic i agree Totally agree. Uh, so I'm excited next, by the energy. Yes, exactly. Um, next up was uh, youth team members' next steps. The one that, that we've been talking about um, is is the uh, for the next step, and there could be some subsequent ones. Is the is a mentor program, and um, so the idea would be that some uh, uh, I don't again not use the word adult, but one of the uh, voting members of the uh, of the, of the energy and climate team would work with a student on, you know, better understanding the, the, the carbon neutrality goals and how to approach that, working on with them on any projects that revolve around energy and climate, um, can help uh, explain things to the extent we understand them. But yeah, it, it, a lot of these, um, um, team um, uh, training programs, you know, when they have them for young adults, middle adults, and for kids, these, I, I actually helped start one years ago. And, and, uh, and so it's, it's a series of uh, curriculum type things that we can talk about, a series of trainings, meetings. Um, and then one of the elements is usually having somebody that you can talk with about these ideas so we don't just have to wait till once a month to have these discussions, ask these questions. So uh, what Michael put out was um, that um, each of you youth team members, if you want and you don't need one, um, you can um, sort of nominate um, a mentor. I think everybody uh, has volunteered except Scott, who's not here today and Brian so far, but not that Brian isn't interested. We, he just hasn't volunteered yet. Um, I know you're a little busy, Brian. You don't have to volunteer. i just checking if you want to. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So that means basically everyone now, but Scott, and I imagine he probably would too. Um, if you had any questions about various expertises uh, that you're looking for, um, or um, level of knowledge, whatever, um, you know, please send me some, uh, some emails, uh, texts, whatever you want to send. And, uh, and, and if you want to nominate somebody to help you out, put it out there. You can put out a couple of names and then we'll, we'll circle back around. But that'll be on your uh, list should you choose to uh, between now and the next meeting. And then uh, Probably at the next meeting, we'll start talking about doing some special sessions like we did that sort of introduction to the team. Uh, we'll probably do another couple of those and we've got some various ideas and you're welcome to contribute anything, uh, ideas that you wish for us to cover in any of these special sessions. Sort of a training, sort of one-on-one -on -one thing. So any comments or questions about, about the mentor program or next steps? Thank you. Very cool. That was easy. 
So uh, the next idea up here, and we only have 10 minutes, so we probably won't get into it, is, you know, uh, we're responding to things as they come up. And so, uh, but what we want to do is create some longer term projects, some longer term things that we wish to work on, things that we see as priority. We've done this almost every year for at least the last few years and probably every year before that. And we actually have lists. We have this information, but um, uh, I just want to put it out there to, to keep those creative juices flowing, identifying things that you think are relevant and important, and then putting those on our list so um, that we can work on them. Um, you know, and it could be as, as specific as, you know, uh, tracking a, a piece of legislation like we're doing or as broad as, you know, revising, you know, the, the carbon uh, goals of the city of Missoula, you know, whatever we want to do. But it helps if there's already some action that's occurring that we can jump onto, like zero by 50, which we haven't done anything with, but it's out there. Um, the 100% clean electricity, that sort of stuff. So we have a few minutes if anybody has any ideas they would like to throw out. Otherwise, we'll, you know, just let it marinate in our brains and we can bring it up later. Yeah, Grace. One of the things I am involved with is a group that is, um, it's a pretty new group, but we are collaborating with um, MCPS, the school district, to um, whatever verb you want to encourage um, sustainable practices and climate education both. Um, and since um, I believe zero by 50, the city version has some connection with, this gets, sorry, this gets kind of confusing, but has some connection with um, the MCPS zero waste plan, but that was never actually officially adopted. Anyways, I can look into the specifics of that. Um, but it might already have a connection to the city level. And I don't know what engagement that would look like, but there's just an opportunity for, um, I don't know, some ties everything together in some ways, so. I had no idea that MCPS had a zero waste plan. Yeah, uh, Jeremy Drake from Home Resource and someone else I can remember his name, also from Home Resource, he doesn't work here anymore. Um, they wrote it, I think, in 2018, um, but it was never officially adopted by the board. Um, so, yeah. Okay. It, di it dies in committee, like, uh, Brian, were you talking about that, or Michael, as far as things dying in the process? Yeah, yeah. But, you know, by um, because the city has now a more formalized program that has established goals and, and recommended practices, it might be easier to resurrect the school districts um, mm -hmm. and, and tie it back to what the city is proposing to do instead of them just doing it on their own. Like, oh my gosh, here's another mandate. Like we don't need another mandate. Um, you know, what are we supposed to do with this? We'll just ignore it. Um, and so it, it might help to resurrect it, bring in the zero by 50. So that's a good one, thanks. One of the ones I wanted to do was write a letter to the editor. You guys are gonna do it ahead of me. So mm -hmm. I'm gonna just check that box and keep moving. Um, Chris, I think, one of the, I think one of the things that could be very powerful from an education standpoint is to have different folks presenting at our meetings when there's time. You know, this month, it, we got into lots of discussion about the legislature, but as we get into like June or July, I start to think about, you know, a tour of the landfill or a tour of the wastewater treatment plant, which we did previously, or eco compost, you know, those kinds of things, um, I think can help to spur some ideas as well. Yeah. Along those lines, um, somebody from, um, Homeward Bound is going to be at our next meeting. And I talked to Andrew uh, from uh, the, the uh, solar uh, group and he wants to come and meet. Uh, but if you have any other names of individuals or organizations, yeah, please pass them along. 
If you have any other ideas for tours, yeah, the next one up was going to be the the landfill and looking at their their methane management, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, process their program, which this team has done before. But I think the only one who's been there long enough to have gone to it is Brian. So it's good to try that one again. So uh, both yeah. of those ideas, I think, are, are really good ones. And Eco Compost does tours on a Saturday. I forget if it's the first Saturday or the last Saturday. You know, we may be able to ask for a special tour on a Thursday. So that's the city run one by the wastewater treatment. Yeah, plant. sorry, Missou Missoula Compost now. Right, right, right. Yep. Yeah, I'm planning on putting that on my yard this year, a whole bunch of it. Good. I hear there's lots of compost to be used. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty excited. Uh, get 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 some healthy soil going. Where I live, the soil was was there wasn't any. It was compacted glacial silts. It's stuff is it's like concrete under your yard. Mm -hmm. It's just really it's really bad. All right. Well, uh, keep the ideas going. Um, and uh, please pass them along. I really have enjoyed uh, this last week with our, uh, the three or four articles, you know, podcasts, uh, you know, websites um, and sharing these things. So we are all become more aware of what's out there and what's available. I thought that was really good. We had some discussion about it. Um, I really enjoyed that, you know, is, is, is doing your own thing uh, for climate change, you know, BS. I thought that was pretty good because I, 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 I kind of fall on the side like, okay, we need the need to do programs that are large, like utility scale solar, utility scale wind. We need uh, broader efforts, you know, like through the city government where, you, you know, it's the biggest uh, uh, financial player, number of employees in the whole city. So when they do something, it's just big versus, you know, me, uh, you know, uh, you know, converting my gas furnace to an electric furnace, which is, is going to be useful, but it may not be that useful. So, but that's, but they also argued in that case that it was useful for you to do it, as long as you can get, you know, 50,000 of your friends to do it too. Mm -hmm. And so I just thought it, it's, it's interesting to look at it and in which way do you approach it? You know, I, I can do what I do in my own house. But if I don't do something more like try to do what we're doing on this organization, I feel like I'm just not doing that much. So, but uh, it's, it was an interesting piece to digress. Hey, Grace, what do you want to say? I'm going to continue to digress, but for like 30 seconds. Um, this is, it's Earth Month right now. And if you go to the Earth Day organization website, they just have a lot of great material on there, both like education related and um some good merchandise and just a lot of stuff on that website to check out. It's pretty fun. So highly recommend it. Mean, Earth Month. I didn't know we had that. I just thought we had an Earth Day. So I learned something new. All right. Well, we're out of time. So our plan is to have our next regularly scheduled meeting on the second Tuesday of next month. And again, pass along any agenda items. Um, we're not taking any action today, just so everyone knows. And uh but if we do, make sure you plan in advance for action items because, you know, we only do this once a month, although we can do special meetings if we have to. Any last comments for the good of the order? Yeah, wait, um, Beef, uh, you were there for the, when we decided on the meeting for the paper, um, for sending the letters to the newspapers? Mm-hmm. Okay, good. Three o'clock on... Yeah. yeah, three o'clock on Saturday. Yep. And I will send a Zoom link out um, either tomorrow or Saturday morning. So. All right. Well, I'm signing off, gang. Thanks for all your efforts and much appreciated. I can't wait thank to you see everybody. you all in person one day. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Have a great day. Bye.